Hello, everyone, and welcome to GW Coders for November 30th, 2023. Um, hopefully, some people will be joining online. I'll keep an eye out for little windows. We'll make the recordings available, of course. Um, as usual, I start with announcements, but there aren't many as we're at the very end of the semester. Um, but there are some workshops being planned for generative AI in the spring, both workshops for students and for faculty. Um, we'll keep those posted in our Slack group as well. Um, and we'll be having one more GW coders for this semester, which will be probably next Thursday. Um, and I'll post it again in Slack and update the Google Calendar. And it's going to focus on creating GPT assistants or agents um, and how to use the newest functionalities of chat GPT. So with that, though, I want to welcome our guest. Uh, we have Kate Pugh um, from Columbia University and the University of Maine. And she's going to talk about her research using NLP methods. So with that, I'll turn it over to you, Kate. Ryan, thank you. I am delighted to be here. I imagine that we've got some people who are going to be joining now when they figure out what room you're in and that we'll have some interruptions. Maybe we'll get that people more engaged that way through a little bit of mixing it up. Um, and I'm pleased to be here in no small part because the two of us have been talking about NLP now for about 10 years. And also the process that we used took us in a sort of unexpected turn towards large language models. And so while there are people alongside us who are using large language models in another discussion about doing statistics and improving performance, perhaps we'll have something to also share with that whole dialogue. I'll share my screen. And as I do this, I will also mark that I have um, some other materials that I may get to if we're interested in it, um, I can show some of the data. And also I have a very good friend who is basically a prompt addict and he presented with me recently. And the two of us had so much fun because I was explaining how I stumbled onto BERT and he had also been using BERT for some analysis he's been doing and how he's been piling on the chat GPT free resources and developing prompt expertise. And I've also been developing some of that myself. So let's just go. Here's my screen. Um, and I will see if we get there. I'm using PowerPoint. Um, and I will just go ahead into slideshow. When I go into slideshow, it's not the greatest for me to see you guys. So please just jump right in and just make any comments you care to. Um, this is informal. I really would hope that we learn all directions. Um, just as a little bit of background, the research that I'm sharing with you really started in the 1990s with a fascination that I started developing in conversation and dialogue. And I really wanted to better understand the features of conversation and dialogue that were conducive to really productive collaborations. When I um, took on the role at Columbia University to be the head of the Information and Knowledge Strategy Master's program, my faculty and I took some of the research from MIT on collaboration and dialogue, and we modified it slightly in order for us to be able to operate in a digital environment. Um, that really just cemented my fascination with quantifying and analyzing and producing um, sustainable conversation or sustainable outcomes through conversation. And so what I'm gonna be sharing with you is a model that is a modified dialogue model from back in the 90s, but with a twist that enables us to also accommodate ways that we can operate synchronously and asynchronously and we can include people in online discussions and in very, di very different types of formats. So, um, hi, I just heard somebody that just said hello. Hello and welcome. Nice to have you there. I see Ayla and RR. Um, we're gonna just talk a little bit about the research context. I'll show you about how we developed our training data. We had um, several different analytic approaches and some of it involved training data and some of it was more unsupervised. 
um, we had um, some really exciting use of the model to determine what the impacts were of different features of conversation, different rhetorical intents, as we call them. And then there are myriad applications for this. And I'm inviting you guys throughout to just poke right in, raise a hand, blurt something out. Ryan will help me if I don't see you. Um, and feel free to add your own experiences. So, um, oops, I heard an echo. Was that I? Did I do that? Hoping that wasn't, that wasn't me who kind of created that. Um, just a little bit of the background. So um, my own experience is in a variety of different um, academic and um, industry areas. Um, but I've had an, a fascination with environmental science and climate change for years. And finally, when it came to getting a PhD, I decided to really double down on the kinds of ways what I knew about humans interacting impacted our success in changing the environmental behavior, the pro-environmental behavior. So what you're seeing is that my research was centered on aquaculture. Aquaculture has immense value, particularly where we're trying to improve food security without continuing to diminish the fin fish and the other fishing um, populations and, and approaches. Um, we in Maine already have, probably these numbers are quite far off, we probably have well over 2,000 residents who are connected to the aquaculture industry. So they're actually farmers or they're um, producers of equipment or they're middlemen or they're um, in the restaurant or the, um, the kind of leisure business involved in aquaculture. Um, aquaculture includes things like shellfish and um, farmed fish as well as seaweed, which is used for more than just food security, but also for substitutes for plastic and a variety of other production um, act, um, applications. Um, it's also a source of innovation because we are trying to move away from petroleum rooted um, materials. And at UMaine, it is a high priority. You've probably read somewhere about the 3D printing of a boat that was using some amount of um, cellulose from the pulp and paper industry to do that, as well as some other substances, all of which were believed to be eventually biodegradable. Although I think that's kind of an interesting thing to do with a boat. Um, hopefully that biodegrading doesn't occur when we're out in the middle of a big fishing expedition. So the aquaculture industry is regulated. The Department of Marine Resource does a lot of background research on the suitability of the particular proposed farm on that particular region, on biodiversity, on um, navigation, on um, destruction of any of the other wildlife features like eelgrass, and even the, um, the indigenous um, uh, sacred grounds that might be somewhere abutting some of these um, potential farms. So there's a lot of research that goes on before the um, farmer decides to meet with others in the town and talk about what they're doing. So when I stepped in was when these least scoping meetings or least scoping sessions were held involving town people like other fishers, people who are doing lobstering, people who are owning land adjacent to the bay, people who were navigating and doing boating, people who are doing recreational fishing or recreational boating all around there. All of those kinds of people were welcome to come to these lease scoping meetings. These were like town halls. And my question was, what are the features of these town halls that make them productive? Like some of them are quite innovative. Hey, have we considered moving the lease? Or, hey, how we consider doing something different as a town to um, promote new innovation? Or, hey, have we made sure that all the voices have been heard? Some of them were just remarkable, and it was an honor to be listening to them. I attended. 
I'm going to I'm going to just finish this slide. I attended seven of these leaf scoping meetings from which I developed transcripts and each of those transcripts I parsed and coded. And you're going to learn a little bit more about that in just a bit. Um, just a little bit more on the background. You can see this is a really fascinating transdisciplinary kind of work. So we are looking at the questions around cooperation and reciprocity in the social ecological systems research area. We're also really interested in game theory. What, what would make it so that people would be supportive of each other in real time? Is it conformity? Is it norms? Is it um, safety? Do I feel psychologically safe? Do I feel like I can take a risk? And then, of course, I'm really interested in computational linguistics. And we were learning at the time of this research, which was in 2020 and 2021, that there was some really fascinating computational research that was going on in the kind of origin story for the large language models. And we did precede the release of ChatGPT. We were stumbling along using BERT and other applications long before everyone had that as a household word. So I was really interested in extending the computational linguistics that were out there and particularly better understanding conversation. The model that we used, I mentioned before, was based on an MIT model on dialogue practices. Because we were really interested in sort of the modern day, both digital synchronous and asynchronous engagement with ideas, we translated that model slightly. So what you're seeing here is the model that we use to code the training data. And you can see that it has a balance of putting out ideas, that's integrity, and asking questions, integrity Q, being positive, that is the courtesy discipline, um, bringing people in or acknowledging them, saying, um, Ryan, that was a great comment, or Ryan, have you had your question answered, or welcome, Ryan, to this session. I'm picking on you, Ryan. <laughs> And then also translation, which is what we do a lot, particularly as academics, to support each other. Hey, um, Jane Doe, who just came into this call, um, let me summarize where we are, or let me synthesize and up-level what we've found. Now, you can see all of these have a sort of anti-flavor, which we call snarky. Originally, when we first started coding this, we actually had 10 different values we were coding. I'm sorry, yes. Yeah. 10 different values we were coding. And then we realized that that was so much. It was basically overwhelming. Um, we also found that it was very, very subtle and we could not create enough data for training any kind of language models, large or small. So we ended up just having a catch-all category called anti, which contained things like sarcasm and insult and interruption. So let me tell you a little bit more about the training data. You heard a little bit about the context. We're in aquaculture. Aquaculture has these town meetings. And you've learned that we've got this five-part discussion discipline model for which we can see different rhetorical intents. This is an, ex an excerpt of one of the transcripts. Um, it's a pretty tight transcript because you can see I didn't put a whole lot of players in there. But you can see that we can label each one. We label them all based on their timestamp, and we also labeled them based on whether it was a male or a female. And I didn't include that in there. But here's an example of a statement. I have not been to one of these before, right? I heard that some person has signed off on this lease. That's interesting. We call that integrity because that's just a statement. Um, okay, so here's something. This guy is kind of adding spiciness to the conversation. Um, he's indirectly criticizing the conversation. That might be what you call anti-courtesy or just damn snarky. Like if anybody's listening to the conversation and they heard the word shocked, they might, be, they might take pause. Um, here's something. This guy just basically says, yeah, that lobster trap needs to go. I know there's this old lobster trap down there that's not being used. There's no hauling in this part of Maine. Um, and that's another example of integrity. That's a statement. But then here's a nice example where there's translation. Oh, yes. Okay. So um, uh, relative to this, there's some changes that need to take place. I'm giving you a juxtaposition. Um, 
And then you'll see he's ending it down at the bottom with we want to be good neighbors. This is what you call a compound move or a compound utterance. When we coded, we broke these into two. So you can imagine there was a lot of manual work, which I know is now possible with a variety of different um, natural language processing approaches regarding punctuation. Punctuation is a good signpost that we need to kind of clip things and make them into multiple moves. Um, and then you'll see here, I'm good with everything that was said as a good example of inclusion. Okay. All right, so here's what we found with about a thousand, what was this? Okay, these, this was about 800 utterances, no, 728 utterances um, or moves that emanated from those town halls. And you can see that the dominant move or rhetorical intent was integrity, which is making statements. Um, questions, integrity Q was the next largest Courtesy was the next largest, which is that positivity thing. Inclusion, which is acknowledging people, was pretty much the same as courtesy. Translation happened less. Um, and then there was this kind of amount of anti, which actually was almost as much as translation. So for every time somebody summarized and says, here's where we've come and where we're going, there were some other instances of a snarky sarcasm or um, indirection. Um, so this was a fascinating baseline, and it was interesting for us to compare that to other data sources, um, which we needed in no small part because we needed to get as many as a thousand utterances for our training data. And you'll see that we also included an online community of practice similar to this one. Um, we also were pulling down from the National Archives Kennedy's discussion about the Cuban Missile Crisis. Um, we used some movies. We had the pilot from Friends, which was delightful, although there was a lot of sarcasm. Um, and then we had one online discussion from a master's course. You can see from this um, big one here is that integrity continued to dominate, but it wasn't um, always dominating at the proportions that you saw in the town hall. This is the town hall-like thing. Um, you see something lower for the online discussion. The online discussion had more snarkiness. So I find this really interesting. You could look at averages across a lot of different contexts, and you could use those perhaps if you're trying to kind of evaluate your, your course um, seminar or evaluate your um, work at your business. Um, a variety of different contexts in which we have conversations like teams and um, analyst calls and board meetings and conversations with our suppliers. Um, a lot of the um, subtle interactions are reflecting status differences. A lot of the almost invisible sarcasm is reflecting competition, but there's often a great deal of generosity. Um, and the outcomes we also coded for, um, there were three main outcomes we coded for. One was kind of the impulse to take action. Um, you can see an example there. The other was what we called relationship building or cohesion. And that's where we measured a delta between the beginning of the conversation and the end of the conversation. There's a lot of evidence that if a group has collectively survived, a point of tension and resolution, they bond. Um, we also were interested in the generation of options. So that's sort of the innovation dimension of these conversations. Um, so the Can quality of question, research. Right? Yes, please do. Um, so is are these contentious issues in these communities typically? I don't know much about aquaculture. Is it? Yeah. So some of the questions or the interactions are going to be just simply, what, what, is, what is a scallop cage? Like, what does it mean to put a, a scallop in a cage? Or what is the hanging of a scallop? Or what is, what is sugar kelp? I mean, is sugar kelp what I see at my front, you know, my front beach? Um, so some of it's inquiry. Some of it's just data. Um, some of it is, oh, my goodness, are you going to have 
your oyster cages in front of my um, beautiful property. I mean, it's perfectly legal because below the water line, it's a collective resource. But the intent for these conversations is to discuss it, to understand what the community needs, possibly to inspire actions. Like if this is bothering you, I'm, I'm just um, thrilled with the idea of giving you a regular supply of oysters, right? So you can see it can be contentious. It also can be extremely collaborative. There are surprises. Does that answer your question? It does. Thanks. Good. So I'm going to go through this relatively quickly. This is just the qualitative analysis of our data. What we did was we took these four of the five discussion disciplines, um, the rhetorical intent, which we had coded, and we saw their relationship to the outcomes. So in fact, this is probably inverted compared to the way you would probably want to see it. You want to see outcomes on your vertical axis. But what you're seeing here is interestingly, when there was um, more proportionate integrity key, which is questioning, asking questions, you're more likely to see options generation. Now, by the way, that's somewhat similar to when there's a lot more translating. Um, this is a little bit muddy and I can explain if you want offline about some of the potential um, messiness of these data because of some of the indirection in there. But the uh, correlation between the generation of options and translation appeared to be evident in this very sort of manual look at our data. This is not statistically significant, but it's just curiously interesting. And if you look at the other diagonal, what we found was quite interesting. So um, inclusion, which are statements of acknowledgement or recognition or drawing people in, correlated with intent to act. And that was some evidence in the conversation that someone's going to say, let's do, um, I will, sort of an intent to go and take action as a consequence of having been in the meeting. And the courtesy appeared to be associated with relationship building. We saw more of a change in the level of positivity. It seemed to increase when there was more of those um, statements that were also positive or respectful or generous. Manual assessment, this was kind of the basis of our hypothesis. Um, you might be curious to see that women were more likely to use um, questions, integrity cue, more likely to use courtesy and inclusion as a percentage of their entire discussions. Um, and this is consistent with a lot of the research by John Malone and Anita Woolley and um, Shabri, I forgot the guy's first name. Um, there uh, what is some evidence that women are more likely to use what we call social sensitivity, which is sort of the intersection between inclusion and courtesy and integrity cue. Um, so training the model. So I'm gonna give you a slide that you've probably seen a hundred times just this idea that there is a trade-off between being able to interpret your model and getting your model to be super accurate. Um, by the way, this predates the release of chat GPT, so we didn't know that there was this thing called hallucinating or you know, strange Turing test survival. Um, we just basically knew that we had some things that we didn't have enough data for, so we needed to use rule-based learning and basically information retrieval. We also, had the luxury of having a new tool released by Cornell called Convo Kit. Cornell was using the TFIDF process and they had a just amazing suite of open source capabilities that they had assembled, including a really good embedding model. Um, and that is uh, that, that TFIDF is a clustering model. So that's sort of smack in the middle of this frontier. And then towards the end of our program, a little bit frustrated with our TFIDF model, we moved over to using BERT, which is the ancestor of ChatGPT. And we went, believe it or not, from doing something that was relatively unsupervised or minimally supervised 
to doing something that was tremendously supervised because we used robust training data to train BERT. Um, so training the model, whoops, sorry, going forward. Um, this is an eyesore, so don't worry about it. No one is being tested and you'll have access to these slides. But this is basically the research um, pathway. So this was us coding. Um, we coded the transcripts, we coded the outcomes, um, uh, we coded 300 phrases for discussion disciplines, and then we also had options generation and intent to act outcomes that we coded for. Um, so there we then, combining the uh, aquaculture and the other transcripts, we had 1135 moves that we were able to use for training and testing. And then we had these open source transcripts. So with the TF IDF process, we just basically said, we believe that these five discussion disciplines are truth. They're like physics. All conversations should have those. Well, of course, the snarkiness too, right? And uh, we um, used those open source transcripts to train the model. We aspired to having clusters magically show us, you can hear from my sarcasm, magically show us that we are um, finding in the wild the five discussion disciplines and snarkiness, um, and we used the least scoping meeting um, data to test it. Um, you'll see in a second that the results were not as great as we hoped. And then we said, this isn't the best, and then we shifted our whole model to using a large language model, and that's where we then trained the large language model with actually the 1135 moves, right? We used all of these. So we used um, the, um, the training data from the least scoping meetings as well as from the, um, the Cuban Missiles crisis from the um, online discussions, from the um, academic discussions, and also from the Friends transcript. So we really did have this super great mix. And we um, tried BERT, and then we also added another layer of ResNet on top of that, it means residual network. Um, and uh, then we did a very elaborate statistical process using a binary logistic regression. And I'll show you these outcomes. There's the, there's the kind of performance of the model. And you will notice that we were dragging our, um, drag, we were dragging a bit when we were looking at the outcomes of the TF-IDF process. So we thought we could boost it a bit by using a lookup and we were able to append to the embedding some um, of the discussion disciplines that we used a very simple kind of lookup and append for. Um, that um, really didn't help out that much. You'll notice that with the 45.2, that's just not a big leap across the entire thing. And then we also did a Poisson normalization because we saw, as you remember from that pie chart, that it is dominated by integrity. So we really have asymmetrical distributions of these discussion disciplines. And we thought, Maybe if we did normalization, we could help it. Um, and as you can see, the normalization mm -hmm. didn't really do a lot of good. I mean, it kind of was basically even without having the, the Poisson normalization. Um, integrity was a little bit better, but integrity could just be a shot in the dark. It's such a huge uh, percentage of the utterances um, that you're going to get it even if you just close your eyes. Um, and you can see, if you look way over here, in this second model, we didn't even find translation when we were using the lookup append. Somehow the lookup append somehow diffused what was evidence already in there. But you will see, we leaped to 85% when we started using just BERT, but then when we added BERT plus ResNet, which a just for some of the overfitting or the underfitting that occurs with an asymmetrical um, data population or variable population. Um, and that's how we got to the 93 to 95% rate. And by the way, all of this is published in an article in the Journal of Neural Computing and Applications. Um, I'm just interested in time. I'm suspecting that you guys have experience with 
the TF-IDF process. So I won't go into a lot of detail, but the TF-IDF process begins with an embedding. Um, in our case, we use tokens that were called phrasing motifs, and those were combinations of bigrams that were commonly occurring, bigrams which we called arcs. We were inspired to do that by Cornell in their Cornell Combo Kit. So you can, if you're interested, you can just go and run a TF-IDF by grabbing Combo Kit. It's very, very self-instructive. Um, and you can see the magic of TF-IDF is that it emanates from the search engine optimization. So we've got in the numerator the richness within the utterance of the presence of a particular token. But in the denominator, we're kind of dissing it um, because we want to see it frequently in the numerator and rare in the denominator, we want it rare in the larger corpus. Um, that's a simple way of understanding it, and you can actually play that out by doing um, just some of the sample math. Um, and this was our results, um, even if you squint, there's really not that much to smile about. Um, we did hundreds of these different graphics. We even did three-dimensional mappings. Um, and increasingly, we found even, what was this one? Obviously, we used phrasing motifs. I mentioned that before. We used the lookup. Um, and you can see this is one of several series of graphics. We got a narrower range. So these became tighter clusters but you do actually see a variety of different discussion disciplines as we manually labeled them showing up in the clusters that showed up in this mostly unsupervised research. Okay, so this is when we're kind of saying, what do we do now? We've got a 45% accuracy rate across our discussion disciplines. And um, we then learned about BERT. Um, actually, this is the combination of BERT and ResNet, but you can imagine a similar confusion matrix that we had used for BERT alone. As you saw, we got an 85% accuracy, accuracy rate like within a week. So we had, as is typical in any kind of research, we had months of doing the TF-IDF process, and then we had one week of using a more appropriate tool. We didn't know because this was long before anybody had used the term large language models in our presence. Um, and within a week, we were able to get the 85%, and then we got a tighter accuracy level coming directly from layering on the ResNet approach. Um, and if you're familiar with convolutional systems, this is how ResNet works. And what we had done in our cycle was we brought the transcripts, sorry, this it's not spelled correctly, but you brought their transcripts into BERT. This gave us our 768 columns which we then went through these pooling and dropout processes in order to deliver us our five discussion disciplines and our snarky. And then that's when we fed it into this confusion matrix and it was compared to the manually coded least, so, least scoping meeting. Um, is that correct? No, actually we used the 1,135. So we used all of the different transcripts that had been manually coded um, to compare to see how it worked. Um, the next, oh yeah, and this is a repeat of what you saw. Um, I don't know why I made a bigger slide of this, but we um, boosted from a 45 to a 90, between 93 and 95% outcome. So there we had a model that we felt like was usable. So we took that model and we ingested these open source transcripts, which we had acquired originally for the unsupervised model. Um, first, we did a correlation matrix. So after having ingested all of those discussion disciplines and labeled them, so we labeled them for, sorry, we ingested all of the transcripts and we labeled them for the discussion disciplines. We also labeled them using information retrieval for the outcomes. And this was a very simple correlation matrix so this Pearson correlation shows you the outcomes, which are relationship building, options generation, and out, um, intent to act, and our five plus anti-snarky, our six um, discussion disciplines. And even though this is just simple binary regressions, right? 
we did start seeing some interesting stuff. So the green was stuff that was consistent with what we had kind of thought we might see. The yellow was just notable. Some of it kind of a really interesting sign, like why is there a negative in here? We hypothesize that's because of a correlation between translation and snarky. Very interesting. Um, and the orange ones were like, what? <laughs> the orange ones were the what? Like, what? Um, but of course, these are just uh, correlations and these are not fully independent. So that we knew we would have to adjust. So we did um, a number of different models. Finally, we realized that due to multiclinearity, we had to reduce the number of variables, but we were able to see finally in this model, one, two, three, four, um, we brought in integrity, inclusion, courtesy, and anti. So we had to drop out translation and we had to drop out integrity Q because of the correlations to the existing variables what we're looking at here is the outcome of a binary logistic regression. What this translates into this expected B um, is that if you increase inclusion by 10 percentage points, you increase the likelihood of intent to act. So this is all about intent to act by 45%. And what we found similarly, if you increase courtesy, by 10 percentage points, you increase intent to act by 34%. What does that mean? Like, what does that literally mean as us human beings kind of going into a conversation? It means that when you are in a conversation and you say, hey, Ayla, or hey, Ryan, um, welcome. Did you have your questions answered? Or nice point, Ryan, nice point, Ayla. I don't know who else is in the conversation, but somebody in the audience now, could you imagine somebody looking you in the eye and saying that I see you? When that occurs, people are more likely to act socially in a socially positive way, a pro-social way. So it's not inconsistent with things like having people put their names on lists when they're saying they're gonna do recycling. If they're known, if they've held their seat, they're more likely to follow through on what they have to say. So that relationship between inclusion and intent to act is very, um, is, is very obvious, but it's nice for us to be able to see this relationship. This is pretty substantial. It's a four to one change. Um, courtesy. Did you, yeah. did you say that integrity Q was integrated into integrity or dropped altogether? So we dropped it out of this, um, regression because we felt like because of the correlations, I could go yeah. into it here. I don't think I ever remember it. The correlations were so high that we felt we had to, yeah. So we had to figure out what was going on. Like this was not expected, right? So it was somehow, oh, sorry. It was so correlated with integrity. There might be something else that's going on here. Makes sense. Right. Okay. Um, why was integrity and integrity Q inversely proportionate? If I had had more time to do a lot more statistics, I'd probably use the dropout process um, in more formally. I did it manually, but I would have used either a dropout process or I would have used a multi-stage regression on top of this binary logistic um, relationship here. Did that, did that answer your question? Oh yeah. Um, the connection between courtesy and um, intent to act was something that uh, was not what we had seen in the manual data. I mean, it's plausible. What we had seen in the manual data was more the relationship between courtesy and the relationship building. As it turned out, the way that we instrumented relationship building was not effective. Um, I had told you before that when we did the manual data, we looked for a genuine delta. At the beginning, people are like dogs, they're just sniffing each other. And at the end, they're frolicking like puppies, you know, having a great time. Um, it was hard for us to instrument that. It wasn't like we could use information retrieval to see people dissing each other at the beginning and then loving each other at the end. We didn't actually have those data. We didn't have enough data to be able to find that with 
with using information retrieval. We could use information retrieval for intent to act in options generation. Um, I didn't include options generation because similarly, we had some of the, we had something that was not um, as significant. Um, it was the intent to act which really jumped out. And there are many implications for that. Um, uh, before I do my last slide. So I mentioned before that there's really exciting research right now in the pro-social and pro-environmental space about changing behaviors and having people engage with each other, engage in, in, um, in a congruent way with their commitments. Um, and how do, you, how do you nudge that? Um, how do you make sure that if somebody says, I will stop um, you know, producing petroleum and increasing global warming, how do you make sure that you're um, holding them account? Um, within a conversation, this can be achieved through this kind of recognition, this kind of inclusion and letting people know that individually they are seen. You could imagine extending that to larger industries and showing industries that they are seen but it's not just simply that they're seen and being criticized, but they're being seen as contributors where they are contributing. And people are more likely to act in a pro-social way if you acknowledge their pro-social behavior. Um, the same can be true in different types of groups. We mentioned before things like board meetings or um, relationships with suppliers or even communities of practice or citizens groups. Um, as people are in conversations with those types of groups, being able to use the discussion disciplines and specifically using more of the inclusion discussion discipline, using the different phrases that are associated with inclusion could improve people's follow through. Um, and I put here in the back, just for your information, I'll come back to this, a little bit about the language, like what is integrity? What is integrity Q? What is courtesy? You know, what are the things that you say in either online discussions or just together that are inclusion? And it's not just inclusion as in, oh, I'm, I'm not racially biased, right? It's more a deliberate thing. How do I draw people in? How do I see them, make sure that they are recognized? Um, so I have those in the back, lots of good things. I've even got, to, I've given you some snarky examples, which you will love, they're hilarious. Um, and then in our conclusions, I can just basically say, this was challenging. We were surprised, but we recovered and we were very happy that we found that large language models were helpful. Today, using BERT, or using ChatGPT or BARD, um, we've got lots more options available to us at a much lower price. Um, and then also, um, we did have challenges because working with rhetoric, you do have a lot of intersections between rhetoric. You have intersections within a conversation. Some of them um, displace each other because conversations just proceed, like that time goes away. It's not like you can pile things uh, after the fact back into the conversation, it moves forward. So um, there are displacements and there are correlations and there are um, many things that are going on within the narrative. And there's also, of course, many things that are going on before the meeting, after the meeting, there are biases that we bring. Um, so that's challenging and that made the um, statistics difficult. And the last thing I would say is that I loved our, my fellow researchers. I was so blessed to work with some um, undergrads who were very, very powerful coders who gave me instruction because it's not my, um, it's not my native activity um, and who were courageous. They were willing to try anything. Um, and so while many of us now just pull these things down from the open source, many of them, the, the, my colleagues, Emily Curie and um, Chris Burke and um, Benji Pugh, who's my nephew, 
were all involved in, uh, they just build things. They just built them. So that was really great. And also Ryan was part of the coaching team along with a num- number of others. So, so I'll stop. Let me stop sharing. So what did you use for your translation anyway? Like, because punctuation is so important to utterances. Having good translation is critical. Or not translate transcription. So, Sorry. Transcription. Yeah. So um, we had um, several different forms of transcription and several different forms of just simply normalization. So, for example, when we used the Cuban Missile Crisis um, uh, National Archive data, the good news was that it had been typed at the time. There must have been a stenographer in the 60s. Um, it wasn't perfect. There was like inaudible, inaudible stuff. So we had to just skip those those words. Um, and so we we were reading some some junk, right? There was some challenges with that. Um, with the online discussions, the good news is that the words are indelibly there. You know, we just are working with online discussions. We're parsing them because many times a single utterance in an online discussion is many different moves, like, you know, pro, con, translating. Um, With the transcripts for the um, town halls, basically what we call the least scoping meetings, we did this manually and we had um, some recordings in some cases to go and validate them. At the time, the Zoom transcription was awful. It, it didn't do a lot of value added. So I have a training in transcription. So I was able to get a lot of the content verbatim. Um, in some instances, I could get the meaning, but I couldn't get necessarily the full content, but it seemed to be sufficient for this work. Um, the last type that we used was the friends transcript where it was a script. So we don't know they, what they actually said, but we know that there's a lot of Um, bodily humor, not bodily humor, there's a lot of um, body movement, um, which conveys a lot that got lost. So if we were to do something like this, as we get more and more progressive with AI, it would be so much fun to be able to include pacing, inflection, um, interruptions, um, gestures, eye movement, we didn't have access to all that. We just kind of scratched the surface. Yeah, so I guess it, you had the advantage then that they were done on Zoom because of COVID. So you weren't exactly. in live meetings with trying to tape record. Right, exactly, exactly. And um, after about the third one, there was no recording going on anyways. It was just manual. Um, actually we really didn't, even after the first one, we're like, there's nothing, this is, it'll take us as long to go and translate from this zoom recording as it would for us to have several manual recorders and just kind of true them up. Hmm. Um, so I want to thank you for this excellent presentation. So I have to also, um, sort of come clean. I met Ryan before, but I kind of like, as I feel um as, as an outsider peeking in what's going on um with the with the meetings um i'm an economist and i work at the cftc and i also teach at gw that's kind of like how i got to know about this this excellent resource um so the way i mean i have to admit i am like i've never worked with a natural uh, language processing sort of setup before but I'm an economist, so we, uh, I have been sort of very much uh, involved with the policy aspect of it. And I want to kind of figure out a way um, to um, utilize the existing resources. Um, so there are, on the, at the SEC side, um, so, so SEC has this uh, proposing uh, release on the disclosure of climate risk. It's not adopted yet, but it's a game changer. And um, and if especially if it goes through, 
And on the CFTC side, uh, there's really not sort of like direct um, efforts with respect to the climate risk, um, but there is um, the 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 mandatory carbon credit markets right now, which is a bit became a law in California, and there's a, also a voluntary market as well. Now, uh, there's a lot going on, and I um, and even prior to all of these, uh, there has been an effort, um, the 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 especially in the sort of the um, managed money side, uh, the managed money. Uh, the the socially responsible like corporate responsibility there's now all sorts of indices um where companies get rated um i mean uh so i mean i excuse my language but there's a lot of bullshit going on um and but there's also there's a lot of information uh that's out there which is important to distinguish between this sort of image building versus the true efforts in sort of what's going on from the corporation's perspective. Now, having all of that <laughs> sort of context, um, so I I mean, it's given the demands on my time, it's really not all that reasonable for me to expect that I'm going to build all of these technical skills and implement all of them um, in, say, processing the information that is going to be in companies public disclosures like what would you advise <laughs> um what would be the path oh my, to go forward <laughs> i mean quite every it's changing by the day right so it's changing by the day um there are a variety of um okay so i think ryan's going to talk about this next week or next month and i hope that i get an invitation to join you because now there are apis sitting on top of chat gpt um, but even use, using ChatGPT, you could say, what are we up to? COP24, right? For COP24, um, tell me inside these manuscripts, right, or inside these transcripts, mm -hmm. um, how frequently or what percentage, or you have to go through layers of the utterances are exuding inclusion and you would initiate it with i define inclusion as we always do with prompts imagine that you are a policymaker who's trying to improve follow through on socially or environmentally helpful commitments imagine and then give them your discussion disciplines these are my definitions and then say considering the transcripts from COP24, or you could even say which session, depending on what you know are available, mm -hmm. um, uh, what would be the shares of these discussion disciplines across the utterances? Mm -hmm. If I could have done that three years ago, I would be talking about a very bunch of different things right now. I am so excited about this. I will actually do that today and see what I can find. Oh, it won't be there in 3.5, unfortunately, unless I feed those transcripts. We'll have to see how much I can do, right? But if you can feed it the transcripts, yeah. right? Ryan, help us out here. <laughs> yeah, but you can feed it the transcripts. You can also feed it training data now to do fine tuning. So if you have labeled data that will exemplify what you're trying to accomplish, then it will do better work at accomplishing that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and okay. you can feed that in if you have 4.0. If you, um, yeah, they don't allow that on the free version, but on the paid version, you can actually you can access APIs or you can upload your own files to serve as mm -hmm. either embeddings or is quasi training data. It's not true training data, but it gets to the same basic point of it. I see. So uh -huh. I mean, you could you could yeah use the table like the one I shared at the beginning, although much more detailed, maybe from the appendix. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, just as a side note, will the slides and present it, like the will they will they be available? It it's in some. I didn't take notes. You drop me an email. I'll send okay. them. I have them already from her. So we don't, I mean, as you can imagine, 
uh, we constantly get an email saying, absolutely do not use ChatGPT. <laughs> um, this kind of, I do it on my own personal computer. Does GW ha uh, have like stations where the, I don't know, where the uh, or, yeah. paid version oh. of ChatGPT is available? Um, no, we just have people, I mean, I pay because it's only $20 a month and I use it every day. So why not? Sure. Um, it, but no, we don't. And that a lot is, is changing. Um, I mean, they're trying to figure out the security risks of having it run on our systems. I mean, we have some faculty who want to run their own large language models on, I mean, large language models are small files, like mm -hmm. 150 gigs is now a small file type of small files. Um, but you could run it on your computer if your computer had enough processing power, but most don't. Mm -hmm. But for now, we can't run it on our cluster. Um, mm -hmm. And we have high powered computing at the university, but they won't let us run language models because it just eats up too much of it too quickly. Um, yeah. So yeah, we're kind of all using chat GPT until we can find other ways to run other models. Um, yeah, I mean, the my introduction to Jet, I mean, the great introduction was with the workshop that you had conducted. That was, that changed literally like how I look at it. Um, I mean, I have been sort of playing around with it, but I mean, it, it's fascinating. Like how learning these basics of how to go about it would not have occurred to me. Um, yeah. <laughs> well, we're doing another in February too, which is going to be more of a how-to where we're going to okay. have breakout sessions. Like how do you use it to write a syllabus? How do you use it to create assessments? Mm -hmm. How do you use it to write grant proposals? Mm -hmm. um, so that we'll post okay. that in February. We're trying to set a date for it. Um, okay, I'll be on the lookout. <laughs> well, I do want to recognize Kate's time. So I'm going to go ahead and stop the recording there.